out. Good afternoon. Please be seated, ladies and gentlemen, otherwise um, strange things might happen. <laughs> Take two. Good afternoon and welcome to the launch of Ron Carey's volume of poetry, Racing Down the Sun. And first of all, I'd like to uh, introduce to you the publisher. Yes, there is such a man, the publisher, Mr. Dominic Taylor. Dominic Taylor. <laughs> Right, I'm going to go to the to the top of the road. I'm going to go to the top of the road. I'm going to go to the top of the road. I'm going to go Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this afternoon. And first of all, I would like to thank the management and the staff of the Limerick City Gallery of Art for so generously making this venue available to us today. It is important and meaningful for us to have the support of venues like the Limerick City Gallery of Art. It's been three years since we published Ron Carey's debut collection of poetry, Distance. And since then, Ron's star in the poetry world has continued to rise, and we are very proud to have been instrumental in bringing Ron's work to a wider public. More so because Ron, like another Limerick writer, Frank McCord, came to writing and publishing late in life. And we feel that his story, like Frank's, has been an inspiration to others who also feel that because of life's commitments, they did not get a chance to uncover their creative talents. Over the past two years, Ron, as a teacher in workshops with various groups at the Limerick Writer Centre, has shared his story, his art, his craft with numerous others and has been a driving force for us in being able to encourage individuals to challenge themselves into unveiling their own creative selves. From absolute beginners to more experienced participants, Ron offers a perspective that can develop a vision with realistic goals that connect with people's deepest dreams and desires. In other words, develop a creative path. Not only does he offer trust and support, but he gently pushes participants into seeing the potential everybody has within. Racing Down the Sun, the book we are launching here this afternoon, is the 82nd title that the Limerick Writer Centre has published to its community publishing program since 2008. Over those 10 years, we have published books of poetry, prose, fiction, and history. But it is poetry that takes centre stage this afternoon. The poetry of Ron Carey, which moves us into the world of the imagination and delivers us from the cold, grey, analytical and scientific view of contemporary life. I believe it moves us into the mythological and transcendent quality of the soul. And this is the vital role that small independent publishers like Revival Press play in the life of our communities. <clears throat> Small independent publishing houses are run by people who do books because of their passion or belief and because of a love of writing, books and literature, certainly not because of the profits they might generate. The Limerick Writers' Centre and Revival Press are committed to continue to contribute to the spread of ideas and literature that can, in the words of Seamus Heaney, catch the heart off guard and blow it open. And I'm certain that Ron's book can do that. Many of you will be familiar with the words of the Chilean Nobel Prize winning poet, Pablo Neruda, who said that poetry is like bread. It should be shared by all, by all our vast, incredible, extraordinary family of humanity. Neruda grabbed poetry from the rich and powerful and gave it back like bread to the people. It is my hope that the Limerick Writer Centre, through Revival Press, along with other small independent publishers, we continue to share the work of poets like Ron Carey with that vast, incredible, extraordinary family of humanity. Garamagia.
see so many people and to see that this event is so well attended. Um, and it's a pleasure to launch this collection here in Limerick City Gallery. And uh, his, as you know, Ron Carey's first collection is Distance and it was published by Revival Press in 2015 and shortlisted for the Forward Prize in Poetry for a first collection. When I launched that collection at the Hunt Museum in Limerick, I mentioned that I was struck by the precision, grace and tenderness of many of the poems in the collection. It's no small distinction given the number of first collections in any particular year to be awarded, to be uh, shortlisted for the Forward Prize. Reviewing the collection, Martin Crucifix said, they, the poems, are acts of recall of a 20th century childhood in Ireland. In this case, Carey invites comparisons with Heaney and before him, Kavanagh. The boy who is the focus of these recollections is both highly observant and very imaginative. His, convi his conviction that there is a leopard in the coal shed as he is tucked up in bed is grounded in vivid details. I'll come back to this imaginative leap from the actual world to a purely imagined one in many of the poems in Racing Down the Sun. The London Magazine said of Ron Carey's debut, Distance, that it deals tenderly and directly with memories of growing up in and coming to terms with the tribulations of post-war Ireland. The most moving pieces paced with the gentle regularity of loose pentameter or brave, heartbreaking recollections. So you can see what we've got there. We've got a, a childhood that is in post-war Ireland, so referencing the social context in which Ron grew up, and the autobiographical story, the growing up in Limerick City. It's interesting to ask where Ron Carey has taken his poems in Racing Down the Sun, or where his poems have taken him. The title poem commands a young boy to race home before the last of the light. <coughs> run, boy, run. Run faster than the falling sheets, dark of sky, whole of evening's impossible fall that it should fall. The poem ends with the boy's heart being pierced by the sun's arrows. There's an echo of Robert Penn Warren's poem, Little Boy and Lost Shoe. Here, where a boy is urged to go find that shoe in the fields before the light goes. The elegiac tone, the note of mortality, is a guide to what we find in the collection. Beauty and sadness. There are several different kinds of poem in this collection. The strongest, I believe, are poems that spring from moments of direct observation, such as Houston Station. As the train is deciding to move, the speaker observes the companion reach across the table in an act of kindness and offer a cigarette to someone in the opposite seat. In the kindness of that moment, both he and I understood how a person can wear kindness like skin. The cigarette trembled in his hand, a visible sign of the earthquakes and fissures within. There's a powerful economy of means here. Without one word spoken, two strangers forge a connection that celebrates humanity. The great Irish designer Eileen Gray <coughs> said that Art is precise, art that is precise and true strengthens humanity. Exactly the same quality is at work in The Long Path, a poem that recently won the Allingham Prize. The speaker recalls an afternoon of work alongside his father in vivid detail. There's an edge and tension all the way through that suggests the experience has had a profound impact. I'm sure that Ron will read this poem later. I, adm I admire very much the way the poem moves from fiction to reality in the opening line. Once in summer, when my father was a bear and I was a Russian poem to imperfect youth. 
The same lyric movement is at work in paper boats that maps a sense of place along the Shannon at full tide between St. John's and St. Luncheon's. It's also there in the dance that conjures young men observing women outside a dance hall and recalls William Trevor's Ballroom of Romance. It's there in Nightlock, a mood poem that captures the atmosphere in the house just before bedtime, reminiscent of Ivan Boland's Nocturne. In the Kamak River, from Myra Close along to Turvey Avenue, to Turvey Avenue. It's a fishing poem that maps Kilmainham and moves from reality to dream. Speaking of communion and Guinness in the one breath, the shift from observation to reverie unfolds in a surreal image. And I quote, Jesus is standing in the Kamak, looking just like he did this morning at the Oblates. John the Baptist, the spit of Charlton Heston, is pouring water over him from a GAA cup, won by someone in a similar, sorry, won by someone in the family between the wars. And you mightn't even have to go back that far. I am reminded here of the poems of Morris Reardon, where a similar type of whimsy and imaginative dexterity is at play. There's a playfulness, and we are no longer in the fearful past, but in the surreal present. One of my favourite poems is The New House. I love the voice in the poem, an adult mediating a child's experience, the formal register. The Australian poet Eileen Kelly said once that poems spring from and appeal not just to the eye or to the ear, but actually have a bodily or a kinesthetic source. And this is one beautiful example of that. It opens with, quote, from the depths of the kitchen, the boy slid on his belly over the tight crew cut of a different carpet to the window where the rain fell in liberal tonnage. Why does he do that? To find out, you may have to buy a copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, a dominant strand of poems in the collection are those that evoke a mythic place, an Irish landscape that is romanticised and larger than life. It's there in Aviator, the smolting children play at fighter pilots, that word smolting takes us to the place salmon go before they enter the sea and migrate. And of course the Shannon is there too. The speaker in the poem is envious of their ability to leave the gravity of the normal in their play. And that is the movement of many of the poems. Whether it's the blind or driving through Mayo or Vikings, <laughs> where children discover a Viking sword in the ground and unearth it, recalling both the enemy slaying sword of Cúchulainn and King Arthur, who drew a magic sword from the earth. The sense of myth is achieved by a narrative that casts an imaginary moment as if it were real. Take, for example, Long Ago It Never Rained. I know you won't believe me, but long ago, it never rained. In summer, every day was like being with somebody who loved you. And although you hadn't the right words then, you loved them back. And the poem goes in that vein. The sense of the mythic is achieved too in a postcard from Mumbai, in the movement from India to Mayo. Into the poem walks a man who, like John Singh's playboy, announces that, I fought with my father, a black demon from hell, and didn't I only kill him with the kirpa? By the time we get to the end of the poem, there's a distinct sense that father and son are in business together, and that the deceased is alive and well and producing loan agreements to sell cars. <laughs> there's a kind of doubleness where the story runs away with the truth, or is it that the truth runs off with the story? And as we move through the collection, this quality of magic realism is used to different effect. 
In many of these poems, we're entirely in an imaginary place from beginning to end. In the house of Lazarus, we meet the biblical figure rising safe and sound from a deep sleep. He wakes in the house of his friend to find the journey still in his bones. In the dust of trees, a golden aureole sings. The poem unfolds and revivifies a sense of the miraculous in a way that we can all identify. There's a similar dreamlike quality in Flood, as if a film is rewinding before our eyes. In many poems, too, there's a dystopic vision. It's the word dystopia, it's the opposite of utopia, of the perfect place. The terror is happening in an all too familiar world. For example, in touching Dublin, the city is destroyed. The skyline of swift and joys made rubble. North and south keys sank into the Liffey. Whether it be a photograph of Vinitsa, the execution of a man at the site of a Jewish massacre in the Ukraine, or gold mine, the death of illegal miners in South Africa, it's a frightening ap apocalyptic vision. And I asked at the beginning, where, this, where do these poems take us, or take him? We started with racing down the sun, and I'm going to, and urging the boy to hurry home before the day is over, and I'm just going to urge you to fit the pieces of the jigsaw together. The final poems in the collection are experimental, and they play with language. They relish in the sound of words and respond to an inner acoustic that is mysterious. I'd like to finish by reading one poem, which is a kind of prayer from the collection. And I'd like to read it uh, today for a godchild, my niece, whose baby is due to be delivered in the next couple of days. And this is called Little One. We have kept our love in waiting. For your coming, little one, while your journey from the future took nine months, nine months round our sun. Welcome to our planet of blue and green and gold. In this perfect imperfection, your story will be told. The gifts I have to give you are the gifts that were given me, the splendor of the mountains, the blue magic, majestic sea, the crunch of snow in winter, an apple summer's day, a kiss of love at bedtime, and faith enough to pray. My final gift, this poem, whatever is its claim, I wrote to show we loved you before we knew your name. And I'd like to declare this collection <coughs> launched and like the baby to wish it a very safe passage. Carey has a very hard act to follow there. Um, I think we could all go home now and get a copy of the book with you. That, that most eloquent um, eulogy, and Ron is still alive, uh, that was by Catherine Phil McCarthy. Ladies and gentlemen, the man of the hour, Ron Carey.
I not only get a kick out of helping people get the best out of themselves, but I have made a lot of friends along the way. And some of them are here today. And it's a great occasion, no, sorry, it's a great, on these occasions to meet up with the Careys and the Newmans mm -hmm. and the Pierces. Uh, over the years I've forged something of a partnership with the Limerick Writer Centre in the person of Dominic Taylor. Some would say it was forged in fire and we both got burnt, <laughs> but we found some diamonds in the embers. And it would be remiss of me not to say something about the ultimate. Uh, among, and they were organisations among the many who helped me get to this, into this new poetic life. <coughs> okay. Well, dri driving, uh, driving rain through Mayo is my first uh, poem. Uh, we were on holidays in Mayo. Uh, this year, you could call it holidays. We didn't get the best of the weather. It was somewhat ferociously wet. And one day, Cathy, my wife, uh, wanted to see Belmont again, where she had her childhood holidays. So we drove there. It was about 50 kilometres from where we were staying, but it felt like 500 in the rain. Well, Mayo is a wild but beautiful country. <coughs> Driving rain through mail. It was one of those days when God forgot he had created light. We followed the graphite road, penciling its determined way across mail. The mist rolled back in its faintness, and the car shot through as if we knew exactly where we were going and we might be able to return. Townlands and parishes changed their names as we drove, defying childhood Irish. <clears throat> In thorn bush and furs, birds cowled under unmanageable tonnage, feathered in a sheen of permanent rain, tongueless crows watched us, eyes diamante. Big boiled sheep, waterlogged in shagged wool, appeared and disappeared under the pulsing clouds as we drove on beyond the innocence of living. And then, from outer space, the sun sent its beams, searching the byways and hedgerows for wonder, and found it in us. In the simple brilliance of realization, our souls uncoupled their safety belts and floated free. Well, Kathy and I were doing a line. Does anybody remember? <laughs> <laughs> Kathy and I were doing a line. <laughs> you remember that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <you. laughs> Kathy and I were doing a line in the events of this next poem record. I was just getting to know what a prize I had. She was constantly surprising me with her humanity and gentleness, and she still does. Houston Station. The train was deciding if it would ever move. In the seat across, a young man, even younger than us, was shedding the last of his humanity. You still smoked then and reached across the table to offer a cigarette. In the kindness of that moment, both he and I understood. A person can wear kindness like skin. The cigarette trampled in his hand, a visible sign of the earthquake and fissures within. You took it back and lit it and placed it between his lips, and as you did, he reached and held your hand like a lover or a father or a child would hold on to his mother. And all of this without one word spoken. One winter's morning, in Houston Station, where the train was deciding if it would ever move. Now, you remember, 
you know, Richard Harris, the actor. Well, Richard Harris always wanted to play for Young Monsters. And my dad was the biggest Young Monster fan of all time. They met a few times at the club, and one night, to the delight of my mom, dad brought Richard Harris home. Slightly drunk. <laughs> Our home at the time was beside Thoman Park, and was later knocked down to make way for the new stadium. The stars shine on Camelot. My dad knew Richard Harris, the actor, who was quite hot at the time in the movie Camelot. One night he brought me home. He kissed my mom and argued with dad about rugby on our best powder blue sofa, the one before last, until his jaguar came roaring, scattering the herd of silver micros from the green and took him back to the safety of Hollywood. There's a photo of the three of them on the wall of our demolished home. <laughs> Now, uh, at this point, uh, as Catherine said, won the Allingham Prize there, well, I think it was last week. I'm a little confused about where I am, do you think? When we are young, we want to be like our fathers and mothers, and like any son, I wanted my father to be proud of me. However, I wasn't very good at the things he was good at, fixing things and making things by hand. I was worried he would think I would always be a loner, which I was, and a bit of a dreamer, which I still am. I wanted to show him that I was well down the road to that wonderful, strange, scary place called manhood. So one summer I asked if he could help lay a footpath, a weekend job for one of the families in the well-to-do area of Limerick. I was about 14 or 15 at the time. The long path. Once in summer, when my father was a bear and I was a Russian pointing to imperfect youth, the sun came close to the earth and we stripped down to trousers and Wellington boots to lay a footpath in the tight garden of the strand. My father was young then, full in the wonder of manhood, muscle and the loneliness of men. Unified by the sweat of work, we lightly touched some kind of understanding, no more or less. At midday, Mrs. Burke brought a jug of lemonade, profoundly cold with deep green islands of lime, thick and loose in the slob of melting icebergs. At the hose, we washed away the abrasive dust, both our heads prematurely twinned in grey. You're burned to a crisp, my father said pointing to my back. Turning the crucified skin between my shoulders, I cried out. All that afternoon, in the chill of Burke's kitchen, overpowered by chamomile, I listened to the hired mixer beat sand and cement to concrete in its iron heart. <coughs> very young, we used to sit out on Saturday evening and watch the girls go to the dance. They would be made up to the nines. My friends and I would sit on a low wall and as they went by, pretend to be knocked over by their person. When I was older, when I was older we went to the local tennis hop where we perfected the art of knowing absolutely nothing about women. You had to be able to dance then. I never got the hang of it. The dance. Under the remembered streetlight, the boys watch the girls pass. Their leather shoes, skyscraper high, exaggerating their femaleness. Incredible barter beehives supported by welded frames of hairspray. Unmade and slow, woodwork promises trawl in their perfumed wake. Sometimes, risking the full stare of the boys, a girl would reignite her lipstick, 
her hand mirror flashing really and imagined signals. The girls, at last safely ensconced in the dance hall, the boys practiced their innocence in the darkness. New hips rocking and rolling towards masculinity. Caught in the beat of the music, the terror of being men dies as they pirouette in each other's arms. <laughs> So it's uh, very understandable and it's sad to see the churches lose the battle for the hearts and minds of the people. And in Dublin at least, a lot of church buildings are closing and being repurposed as offices. This is a poem about how an estate agent might sell one. The Converted Church. Your desire for office space will find fulfilment here at St. Heaven, at St. Kevin's of the Ghetto's conversion to an earthlier estate. Please note, at a certain time of day, our stained glass windows explode with light. We call it the E.B. Home effect. Causing your computer screen to blaze and bathe the most <coughs> faces of your employees in sulfites. But if the crucifixion disturbs the environment you wish to create, tell us and we will take it down. We understand. It's not everyone's cup of tea. Here, the office manager can keep an eye on the staff as they crisscross the original Verona marble floor. And here we have gone for the distressed look. Chipped and colourless angels surrounding St. Winifred in Estes. The mosaic was relayed by someone from the liberties of Spanish extraction, we are led to believe. There are so few people in Ireland with the skill set to handle such artefacts. We were forced to fly an expert in the work uh, sorry, into work on Abadi's The Resurrected Christ. The final restoration has to be seen to be believed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm getting there, I'm getting there. So when I was in hospital, uh, we're all in hospital sometime, but I was in hospital there a year or so ago. And you think you're going to get out any day, so you don't make friends for you. Just kind of know not to help people. The man in the next bed was told very bluntly he had not followed the regime set out for him and now had about one year to live. I was very shocked that this was done in so publicly, but perhaps the doctor forgot that there was someone in the next bed because my curtains were closed. A sentence with death in it. As her disconnected voice outlined a proposal to make his life pain-free in the year ahead, I tried to remember the name of the man at the next bed. I carefully studied the seven or eight unidentifiable splashes on the nylon curtain that rendered me invisible. I took time out to admire the nurse's tight cheek corners to count the battle scars of wheelchair tracks on the floor, to take in from my chilly window the lawns butchered and dressed, splay hedges clipped to the last inch, a giant tree offering up a handful of chestnuts. <coughs> then she was gone, all hospital agreements broken by his weeping. The cold floor wobbled as I shuffled to his bed. Outside, the Emperor's son lay in the shadowed fields of winter, while two old men held hands as if we were children on our first day at school. <laughs> now, Robert Frost said, the, the sound is the gold in the world. So in the section, the songs we sing inside the gates, I tried to experiment with sound. The sound I wrote was the words that I liked. And then I tried to join them up to make sense. It worked some of the time. Mm -hmm. Ring round vision's pleasure. Ring round vision's pleasure, the gannet folds its slimness, dives, 
iron rigged, fettered in flash, the prize, it rises, splits sheets of tension, exhales, down period, days, years, life unraveling, centuries, fishful, salt eyed circular of the Caribbean, the Atlantic tree, arrowed in strike and in the van, being glorious. <laughs> That's the first time I've tried it out. See, anybody get anything, anything out of it? I think it, it bears reading a few times. That's what I'll say. My daughter Jane is trying to interest me now in, sorry, is trying to interest me in living in the now. But the past is gone, so leave it there. The future is a series of nows. Now, now. <coughs> Here is my poem, how that might feel uh, after having achieved such uh, state. O oh, surrender, my surrender, this completeness. O oh, surrender, my surrender, this completeness. Allowing all allowance, death no more, no more denying, no more passing. Oh, what sweetness. Please take me. Will you take me, take me home? The I no more, now released from freedom, from thought and fantasy for which all sadness comes, to understand, be understood. What sweetness. Please take me. Will you take me? Take me home. <clears throat> This uh, poem is called The Art of Poetry. I've reached a stage where I am sometimes asked to have a look at someone's work. And when I look at their poetry especially, I'm always conscious of the fact that they are telling me their story. Sometimes I see myself in them as they are starting out. <coughs> the Art of Poetry. Send me your poetry, I said, and I will try to help. He sent me sheets splattered with blood and tears and a fixed hopelessness that made me gasp. I suggested he move a droplet here and a bloody metaphor over there. He countered that I didn't love him, that I hated poetry because I was a poet, that I was a sham, a boneless thing that had crawled out of the slime. I suggested we meet. The cappuccino went cold in his cup, and the sun went down, and night flooded the street. Finally, he came, bringing his own terror with him. He was so young, I thought I might cry. He threw the bag of poems at my feet. There, now you have me, he said. We spoke until we discovered we had the same father, mother, brothers and sisters, but we were equal in guilt and lost in the slow ascent to happiness. So, there's only two more to go. You're doing great. <laughs> uh, my wife and I were staying overnight at my son David's house. About three in the morning, I half woke to find my blonde, pale-faced granddaughter standing beside my bed, silent and ghostly. I jumped two feet in the air. Later, when I had fully recovered, I wrote a poem. Unicorn. My grandchild stood beside my bed. Someone is calling me, she said, and she put her icy hand in mine. In her room, she pointed to a ghost of light behind the curtained window. Someone is calling me, she said. Something tapped against the glass. It was a magpie knocking the house of the snail and gorging her flesh. It's a unicorn, I said, but if we open the curtain, it will certainly disappear. What do you think we should do? Let's just sit and listen. 
Later, the adults found us out on the edge of imagination, listening for the exciting tap of a silver horn against the double glazed wood. <laughs> <laughs> Raising down the song. As a child, all I ever wanted to do was run. The non thinking joy of life type of run. There is certainty in running. You are alive and you are running. You are alive and you are running. Past and future mean nothing at that moment. You are as free as it is possible to be. I can't run now. But that is the way I always want to feel. Racing down the sun. When I was a boy, hard to remember, hard to tell, waiting at the edge of heaven, sunset, ready, run like hell. Go on, run. Run, boy, run, run faster than the falling sheets, dark of sky, whole of evenings, impossible fall, that it should fall, don't fall, don't fall, that fell and always would and always would before I could reach home. The last of the light sweeps earth's floor, its brightest colours to apply. Now apply this red, this blue, this yellow, this white. They count me down again until I am that lonely child and still Gracing the quickening dark the hill Up and over how fast will these legs run And once again my heart is pierced Pierced and pierced and pierced and pierced By the arrows of the setting sun Thank you <laughs> Such a good friend and supporter, and most of all, she is a brilliant host. Thank you, Kat. I want to thank my own family for putting up with me and for their never ending support Jamie, David, Rachel, and Anna. Thanks especially to David for allowing me to use this painting of my grandson William for the cover. Isn't it brilliant? I know. Yes. I want to thank my wife, Gabby, for always being there for me and for every good thing in my life. Thanks to Dominic Taylor and Revival Press for publishing Racing Down the Sun. I hope it does the proud. Thank you all. I really mean it. Thank you. Thank you.